Let's go to the next thing. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Stephen Murray. So Stephen is a student in process that has created very interesting projects for the warehouse robots. Yes, and for warehouse robots, one of the most important features is to be able to detect the shelves that it has to carry around, then attach to them, and then bring the, the, the shelf wherever it is necessary. So in this speech, Stephen is going to show us a ROS2 software design process and using the warehouse automation case as a typical study for this. So let's welcome Steven. Steven, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. So Let's the audience is all yours. OK, just a second, because some problems again, like in the first speaker. So it looks like they cannot hear you. Just a second. Let's see what's happening here. OK, now, can, can you, you speak? can you speak? And we check that. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's just the stream that maybe the the sound. Yeah, we have it. We have it. Great. So okay. all yours, Stephen. Hi, OK. So before we jump in today, real quick, just you can scroll down in the notebook under this launch the simulation tab. We have this command to launch the simulation. Go ahead and copy that into a terminal. Okay, this got confused. We have two separate commands. Go ahead and launch that because it can take the simulation a while to get started. And so while I do the introduction, we can wait for the simulation to load. So, yeah, as was mentioned in the introduction, the title of my talk is the ROS2 software design process, a warehouse automation case study. And that might seem like a very complicated title, but this is really a talk intended for beginners. The idea of the talk really is to introduce you to going from here, I have a problem that I'd like to solve with a robot to here's a solution that works on a real robot in the real world um, accurately. And so the thesis of my talk is that to solve such a problem, you really need to go through a four step process. And the four steps are as follows. Step one is to define the problem. Step two is to solve as much of the problem as possible using existing ROS packages. Step three is to solve the remainder of the problem using custom software. And the final step is to solve problems related to the difference between simula simulation and reality. And so we do this, yeah, so, and I think this talk will be valuable for you even if you never find yourself programming a mobile robot in a warehouse situation because this process is very generalizable. And so what I really hope you take away from this talk today is an understanding of why each one of the steps in this process is invaluable. Why you, And so even if you just sort of pretend, oh, I'm not going to worry about that step in the process, no, um, it is important. You have to do it. And then the second thing is I consider, I hope you consider for the other talks today, um, consider which step in the process do those talks cover. I suspect that most of them really are going to focus on this step two, solving as much of the problem as possible. Okay, so now my simulation is loaded. Hopefully yours is loading soon. So step one of the process is defining the problem. And realistically, this is probably the most important step of the process. It's the foundation that everything else is built up on top of. So I think even if you came away from today's talk and you said, you know, I'm going to do a really good job of defining the problem before I ever get started, that would probably be worth the price of admission. But so as software developers, you know, our first instinct is to just jump in and start writing code. And that's a problem because if you don't, if you haven't defined the problem correctly, you know, you could very easily solve the wrong problem and waste a lot of time. So today's problem is as follows. We want to program the RB1 robot to leave the stop, start square, drive under the cart, and pick the cart up. So I'll just make my gazebo big real quick. So that's the start square over there. That's the cart. 
So we're going to drive out to the cart, and then we're going to drive under the cart and pick it up. And that's the goal of what we're trying to do today. But there are some caveats. We need a solution that's robust to different warehouse layouts, robot starting positions, um, and cart positions. So what I like to think of this is, yes, we're going to be testing it with this warehouse setup, but the idea is we want to have a solution that we could maybe run on a different warehouse um, somewhere or with maybe slightly different cart positions. And we don't want to have to set the robot up very precisely. We sort of just want to plop it down and have it work. So step two, we've defined our problem. Step two is to use as much of the existing ROS packages as possible to solve the problem. One of the advantages of using ROS is that there are a lot of packages already that solve problems. And also because all these pro um, packages are built on top of ROS, we have a nice way to talk to these packages. And so in this package, we're gonna use the ROS1 bridge, cartographer ROS and nav2 packages. So this was the simulation. Um, I use this terminology here where I have a little button that says execute in terminal tab sim. That means rename the terminal tab. You can do that by double clicking on it and changing the name. That just helps us with bookkeeping and knowing what everything is. Um, the next thing about today's project is that the RB1 robot, which we specified we're going to use in our problem statement, um, runs ROS1. But all the code we're running today is ROS2. So we're going to use a ROS1 bridge to allow the ROS2 code to talk to the robot and vice versa. So we do that by copying and pasting all those commands. Um, and we'll name this tab bridge. Now to test to see if the bridge worked, we can do a ROS2 topic list. And as we can see, the bridge didn't work. So we're going to try again. OK, that looks a lot better. Again, up arrow to rerun. OK, so. Here are all the topics. So that looks like the bridge works. So yeah, recall from our problem definition that we want to give the robot coordinates and have the robot drive there. I mean, that was a big part of this. And so thankfully, this problem has been already solved using the NAV2 packages and Cartargative SLAM. So we're going to use Cartographer SLAM to first make a, where, a map of the warehouse. Then we'll use NAV2 to localize the robot in relation to the warehouse. And really the important thing here is not necessarily the details with how to get NAV2 working, but really that we're, all of this can be done with off the shelf NAV2 software. So before we get any further, we're gonna run this command to, that allows you to drive the robot around. You can just copy and paste that. Yeah, it's very important you get all of it. And it's and call the tab tally up. So make my robot bigger. You drive it around using the IJK keys. Okay, and you see I could move it. The next step is to make a map. Um, we're going to do that in a terminal tab called SLAM. So here's the command. So that's going to launch the SLAM node, and then we're going to open up another node that opens up RViz that will help us visualize the map that the robot's making. I'm going to call this slam arviz um what i recommend is just 
You can drive it around using just the output of the slam. It's going to move in the sim, but to make it easier to see, I recommend doing it this way. And so you'll notice that as we drive the robot around in teleop, remember you need to have, you need to be on the teleop tab, you need to click inside the body of the window in order for teleop to work. So as I spin around, you can see um, it filling in the map. Okay, so I'm just gonna drive it down to where the cart is. We really only need to map one half of the warehouse because we're not going to be sending it over to the other half. Okay. Let me just move it in over a little more. Spin it around a little bit more. I'm trying to get that area to the next to the cart pretty well. And then I'm going to send it back to about the home area. Okay, so it's at the home area now. And as you can see, we have a map roughly of what's going on. So now that we have a map, the next step is to save it. Um, if you didn't get this step for whatever reason, I think you'll be okay. We should have, you probably already have files in the Ross check. But if you wanna use your map that you've just made right now, you can run that map the saving map command. Okay, so now we have a map. Now that we have a map, we can kill the slam Arviz and the slam. and we're gonna go on to the localization step. So now that we have a map, the next step is to have the robot localize itself in the map. So the robot needs to um, look at the incoming lasers and the encoder data and figure out where it is in the map. So to do that, similar process, we launch the server and then we launch an RViz associated with it. Here's the server. Um, call the tab loc for short for localization. And then we're also going to launch an RViz, making sure to get all of the RViz. So notice we're getting a bunch of garbage and we aren't seeing our robot in our RViz. And why is that? That's because the first step of NAV is you need to give it a 2D position estimate. So you need to give it a rough idea of where the robot is. I'm just gonna guess over there. Okay, so now you'll see this red is the data from the laser. And you can see it's not very well lined up with the world because I gave it a bad estimate. But that's okay because we can use this teleop command. And I think it find it works really well if you spin the robot around. So as we spin the robot around, you can watch the map, the laser shift to a line with the map. So we've seen that localization works. We can drive the robot around, see the robot is keeping track of where it is in the warehouse. You can. Okay. That's localization. The next step that we're going to do is launching a path planner. So we, you know, remember our goal was to give the robot um, 
points that we wanted to drive to and have the robot automatically drive to those points. And so we're going to do that using the path planner. I'm going to rename this to local. So again, similar procedure, launch the path planner node. And we're also going to launch the RViz. And now we can give it a goal. Let's say we give it a goal over there and the robot will drive to it. So again, the key thing here is that this is all off the shelf ROS. We don't, we didn't have to write any custom code to do this. This is really just launch files and, and YAML parameter files. So you can play around with that for a little bit and then, and then when you get, when you're happy with it, you send it a couple goal positions and you really like it, you can send it a 2D goal close to the cart. Somewhat pointed roughly at the cart. Don't worry if it doesn't quite get to the cart. Um, just as long as it's generally pointed at the cart, we should will be fine. So this time, this is a pretty logical um, thinking point. I don't know if everyone's keeping up. No, we can sit here for a little bit. Let people get caught up. Rename my tabs. Okay, so that was the off the shelf stuff. Now we need to solve the remainder of our problem using custom software. So as we said, you know, using the default ROS2 stuff will get you pretty close to the way there, but you still need, oftentimes if the problem's complicated, you're gonna have to write some specific code for your particular use case. So in this case, we really want the robot to drive under the cart. But doing that with NAV2 won't work so well for two reasons. And the first is that NAV2 sees the cart and, that, and NAV2 thinks obstacle. I don't want to drive under that. And then the second reason is that the cart might not be put back in the same place in the map frame every time. So when a robot's done using a cart or the person's done using the cart, they might not put it back exactly where they're supposed to. And so what we really want the robot to do is we want the robot to look for the cart in the environment and then drive to where it detects the cart currently is. Um, to make the cart easier to see, it's in real life, it's outfitted with retroreflective markers. And so a retroreflector is a device that reflects back light back to a source with minimum scattering. And so in this picture, it looks like the reflectors are glowing, but I assure you there are no lights. There's not a light bulb in there. It's not LED. What it is is that there's a light source behind the camera and all the light a lot of the light, like things that are like hitting this box, that light just scatters off all over the place. Whereas the light that hits these reflectors comes straight back at the camera. And that's why these look really bright. And so we're gonna take advantage of that today because our LiDAR laser sensors, in addition to giving us a distance, also give us a reflection. Also tell us the intensity of the reflection. So we can use that to detect the cart. So we're gonna launch another RViz to just get a brief idea of what's going on. So we're going to call this cart RViz.
So the important thing here is to notice that most of most of the world's red, according to the laser, but the two places where the reflectors on the cart are purple, are this bright purple pink. And that's how it knows where the cart is. And so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch some custom code that drives under the cart. So just copy this command. Again, this is a really long one. Make sure you get all of it. So this is gonna start a service server that is listening, listening for a request to drive under the cart. And then we're supposed to call this cart service. And then the second thing we need to do is we're gonna call the service. We're gonna call our custom code. I call it. And you'll see here that it, it detected two retro reflectors and now the robot's gonna slowly drive towards the cart. Slow and steady wins the race. You know, we gotta be careful. We need to make sure we're not just driving to the point under the cart. We need to make sure that we approach the cart from the front and that we don't hit the legs or anything like that. So just sit back and wait. Okay, so it drove under the cart and you can see the robot picked up and lifted the cart. So as near as, I, as it looks like we're done with step three. And so the question is, are we done? You know, we got this working in simulation. Do we just get to go home and celebrate? And the answer is no, we need to make this work on the real robot. But for the purposes of today's presentation, now we can't have everybody in the audience connect to the real robot because there's only one real robot and there are more than one of you in the audience. So instead, what we're gonna do is I recorded data from the real robot in the form of a Ross bag. And so you're gonna play that data and use that data. So I collected data of the robot in this position that you'll see. So it's near the cart and it's facing the cart. And so the, what we need to do for this is you really only need the bridge and the laser arv is working. So we're gonna go ahead and kill pretty much everything else in the cart service. So sim, we don't need the simulation anymore, remember, because we're gonna be using the data from the ROS file, ROS bag, not the simulation. Bridge we still need. Um, this is for testing, we'll keep that. Teleop we still, no, teleop we don't need. We'll kill teleop. Localization we don't need anymore. Localization RViz we also don't need anymore. Planner we don't need anymore. Same thing with the planner RViz. Cart RViz we need, cart service we need, and being able to call the cart service. Okay, so close the simulation. And now we're gonna do the necessary steps to look at the ROS bag. So the ROS bag is running under ROS1. So we need to source and run the ROS bag. Or run ROS core so that we can run ROS bag. Okay, we've launched ROS core.
And now we're going to play the Ross bag. Um, we're not seeing anything. This could be the bridge. Uh, I'm not seeing anything in our viz, so gonna kill the bridge and you can rerunning the bridge. When you rerun the bridge, make sure to rerun everything. Okay. So we can see this looks very different from what we were seeing before. Before we had these nice, perfect um, red for the walls and pink for the cart. And now you can see real life, real laser, bit messier. I mean, we can still see these high intensities for the cart, but it's different. So scroll back down. Um, let's try running our cart service again. So make sure you have the cart service running and then go to the, this should be called whatever the, whatever you send the cart message to. And if you switch back to the cart service, um, it's showing a lot of junk, but the important thing Okay, we'll do it again. The important thing is that it's gonna show that it doesn't see any reflectors. The num reflector zero. And finally did not find the cart. So this code, we just saw it, it worked in simulation, but it doesn't work in real life. And the question is why? So my hypothesis is that it, has to do with the difference in these laser numbers. And as we saw here in Arvis, we see colors, but what we really want are numbers. So to do that, we have this special plotting script. So again, we're gonna create another tab called plot. We're gonna run this plotting script. Um, okay. Yeah, this might take a while if, since we're running it for this first time, matplotlib lib needs to do a little initialization. Okay, so here we are. And you'll see, here's our real-time plot of the Rossbag data. And for the purposes of what we were running before, um, I had a threshold of 7,999. So I had it way, and I said anything above that, that's a cart leg. But as we can see from the real world data, that threshold is way too high. And that's why we're not seeing the cart is because the threshold that works in simulation does not work in reality. Um, and so what can we do to that, do to fix this? Well, we're just gonna change our threshold. In this case, this isn't too bad. So we've stopped running the raw ser cart service. We're gonna run it again. And notice we have this launch argument of threshold equals 4,000, and that's how we're changing the threshold. So run the service, and now call the service with the new threshold, switch back quickly, and you can already see it started to run, but the most important thing is that it says number of reflectors two. So now that we change the threshold, this is going to work. So to recap, we followed a four-step process. In order to solve this, first we defined the problem. In particular, we said, you know, we're really we need to be able to send it waypoints and also drive under the cart. And so that necessitated that we'd use nav2 to solve a lot of it, but then we wrote custom code to drive under the cart. And finally, we ran this on a real, we ran on a Ross bag of the real robot, and we saw that tweaking was necessary to account for differences between simulated laser and reality. And now we're going to try a demo on the real robot.
So I'm just going to kill everything and Um, so for the so audience, let me clarify that this uh, step connecting to the rear robot is only available to the speaker. It's not possible to do it oh. for all of you, as Stephen has mentioned before. Okay, yeah. Should have made that clear. So again, like the simulation, I'm going to launch the Ross Bridge. So that looks Let me just check to make sure that it, the bridge worked. Okay, looks promising. So now we're gonna launch it and hope for the best. Uh, Okay, so here we have the real robot. This is the first part where it's using nav2 to get close to the shelf. Okay, and now it's doing that code that we were, the custom code to drive under the cart. Okay. So hopefully it should lift the elevator. Okay. And now we're gonna drive back to the starting square. Okay, so, so that concludes the demo, I would say. Okay, I guess it's going to tweak its position a little bit. Looks like it's done. I don't know whether I've trapped. Okay, he can get out. So um, with that, I think this presentation is done. Um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Stephen. Fantastic presentation. Amazing, amazing presentation. Congratulations from all the, the construct team, really. Very impressive, impressive stuff. Fantastic. Thanks. Very good. Very good. Also, at the end, also, so I have recorded. We, we saw you, we saw you. Ah, yeah. yeah. We saw, everyone saw you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs>
<laughs> so I will send you the videos later so you can have it for your record. <laughs> okay. So uh, you can post the questions on the, the tab and vote for the questions that are more interesting for you. And in the meantime, you yeah, have some Let questions. me ask him one question. Well, actually, there are some questions already there on the panel. Fantastic. So let me go straight to the questions from the audience. Stephen, the first right. one. Uh, this one from Samuel Prieto. He says, uh, what pipeline do you use when writing custom code for your projects? Do you still use open source available code as a base? Um, yeah, I mean, it very, generally, yeah, very... I mean, obviously, the goal is to reuse as much stuff as possible. Um, but yeah, we're using, in this case, we're using open source stuff. You know, we're still using ROS messages and ROS. I don't know. I, I sound like I'm failing to answer the question, but, you know, yes, you do use open source code. Um, it's just sometimes to solve the rest of the problem, you have to, you have to tweak it a little bit. Exactly. So it's like... Uh, it this open source, it doesn't work off the shelf or all the conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to adapt. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, let me ask you this question because it's very cool. It's a very good question from Hassan Hariri. And he says, why did not get the to the final position? So there was a, a small, you know, error in the position. Um, what do you mean with regards to, oh, the square? Yes, to like the, final the final square. square. The final when, um, when it's carrying the, the shelf into the I mean final. because in my code I set the goal not quite next to the wall. Um so like in my code, I, I'm not telling it to go all the way up against the wall. Um part of that is I think there's a there's a door nearby the ending goal, and so I'm terrified that someone's gonna open the door into the robot and <laughs> hit it. Yeah, and um, also navigation has a uh, a tolerance, right? Yeah, so you don't want to get too close to the wall. You might run into it. This way, this way, you know, nav is going to is going to stop. It's going to say, "Okay, we've gotten close enough." Yeah, Whereas if you put it right up against the wall, it might not be happy. Yes. So you have to establish. This is a parameter of navigation that you can establish, and is the tolerance to the goal in terms of XI position and also in terms of orientation. So you can specify this. And uh, yeah, because it's too close to the to the wall and to the door, then it's better to increase this. So sometimes you get those behaviors then. In real situations, what you would do is then afterwards, when the robot is stopped, then you activate a second system, which is an independent system that just uh, does the final approach, which is the one in charge of just correcting those small errors in the system. And it, this is not included in the navigation system. It's, mm -hmm. it's your own program that is specific for the situation that you are in. Yeah, you would use uh, some markers, QR, or something yes. more robust for close-up movements. Yes, in this case, the, it can be used the laser, for example, yeah. as, because it's detecting the wall, and then you can make it align properly to that, yeah. and add to the, up to the centimeter also, if you want yeah, close to sure. Okay, we have uh, more, more, question, more, more question. questions. Uh, Brian Me Merritt, uh, he, he asks, uh, in real life, would you use um, behavior trees to switch from uh, a nav mode to custom mode code, for example? Um, um, I yeah, I, I think maybe that's an option, but mm -hmm. for this project, I didn't do that. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, um, nav2 is, I think nav2 has behavior trees you know that's a core feature of nav2 um we just didn't do it this way for this one mm -hmm. but i would agree that that seems like a, a great thing to do mm -hmm. okay uh, more questions yes more questions uh one for marcus vinicius that says uh, i didn't figure out why reflection lasers um required around the car so is there a sensor that captures this intensity to approach the cart which one uh, yeah, so, right, the the robot has a laser scanner, so you can think about it is that for a whole bunch of different angles, it sends out a little laser beam, and that laser beam travels, then it hits something, and it bounces back. And so I think, like, it uses the time it takes between when it's sent it and when it receives it. That tells it how far away the object was, 
And then the other thing you can do is you can look at how strong the light is that comes back. And so, you know, so yeah. So like when I was showing that picture, the camera photo, you can see how this is very bright. And it's the same sort of thing with the laser. When the laser comes back, it's going to be very strong. And so, yeah, it's the same sensor, the same laser LIDAR razor range finder that's used to detect the walls and stuff is also gives you that intensity. Yeah, actually, in the same ROS message. So there is yeah, a field same ROS inside message, yeah. that is called the ranges and another is called the intensity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Mayar Joneja. In the real world, for mapping while running SLAM, do you use some version of Teleop or does it drive around on its own? I don't um, know. For this project, I use Teleop, hmm. but um, right, is that's just easier. And, and that's a good point to mention that the, the map that we made in simulation would not work on the real robot. You have to redo the mapping. Hmm. Um, but I think there are, there are ways to make things map autonomously. Uh, I didn't do that for this. I, I think, I mean, again, that all goes back to defining your problem statement. For this, I guess we assume that we have access to somebody who can drive the robot around a little bit to get the system working. But I could see where there might be situations where, you know, you can, you want the robot to autonomously map. Exactly. Well, let me clarify to the, to the audience, to Mayan, that what she, what he is asking is called, is called exploration. So it's autonomous exploration, and it's when the robot is creating the map at the same time that it's learning the environment where it, where it is. And this could be useful if you don't want to have a setup, a person doing a setup of a robot, for example, in a in a large uh, mm. magazine. Uh, Mall. Mall, yeah, exactly. On a large mall, then you just leave the robot there when you buy it, and then the robot will figure out where to work and create a map. That's called exploration. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also in environments that for any reason you don't have good communication with uh, the one that has the teleop or something, maybe you need that the robot does the map autonom autonomously so that it works without anyone. Okay, more questions? We have until... Uh, let me let me ask this one about Alejandro yeah. Serna because yeah. I think it's, it's going to clarify to some people. It's they say it, is it possible to run ROS one and ROS two in the same computer? Yes, I mean that's what we've been doing. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So no it's it's uh, we use the ROS bridge, which yeah. uh, communicates, and you can use both, and they communicate. And the only thing is the sourcing, right? That you have to source in one terminal, ROS1, and ROS2 in another terminal. Even you can use yeah. different versions of ROS1 or ROS2 in different terminals. It's just the sourcing. Mm -hmm. More questions. Um, then it says, uh, Ale another question from Alejandro Serna. Ah, it's the same uh, guy, yes. So how did you actually do the switching from navigation to to a custom code just in the final approach of the card. So um, yes. So um, Nav2, the way you interface with Nav2 is it sets up a localization, sorry, uh, a path planning server. So you send a message to the server and then it will drive the robot to that location. And so the way my code works is I would, you know, I'd have my code and my code would call the server the server would make the robot do its thing, then I'd run my custom code, and then I'd call the server again to make, you know, like call the server to send it out to the goal, custom code drives it under, then call the server again to drive back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We have also a question from Alberto. He says, um, how did you manage to change in the robot footprint when it gets attached to the cart? How did you manage that? Uh, um, I cheat. I used <laughs> the the cart footprint for the whole the whole time. Ah, okay. But, okay, but, okay. But yeah, you know, I think he's right that you can like the the footprint is a parameter and so theoretically you could hmm. you could you could change that. Yeah, that was a question that I have I had uh, for you also, which is what is the difference in the navigation 
when, when uh, the robot is not carrying the, the cart, the shelf, and once the robot is carrying it, because the, the shape is completely different, it's mm -hmm. big, so that's related to Alberto's question. So how, how is this that different? Um, so I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Like, so I mean, because the, the shape is bigger. different, it's smaller in one case, and how does it affect to the navigation? In which um, part of navigation affects? I mean, well, it affects the path planner because mm -hmm. the path planner looks at the um, looks at the footprint, and then that that's how it calculates where the robot can or can't go. And Ross is smart like that. You can you can give it the coordinates of the four corners of the square, and then it uses that to figure out where the robot can and can't go. And it's even smart enough to say, okay, you know, like with the circle, any orientation. You know, the footprint doesn't change depending on the robot's orientation, but with a square, you have to keep in mind that changing your angle sort of changes the, the footprint of your robot. Your orientation changes the footprint. And to clarify Alberto's question, there is a topic, which I don't remember now the name, where you can publish the new footprint. So you can have the footprint is the is the shape that the path planner, as, uh, as Steven is explaining, oh, yeah. is using for doing the calculations of the available uh, route to reach a goal. And then that's a footprint. And then it should be round, the footprint, in the first case, when the robot is going to search for the cart. And then afterwards, when it has captured the cart, then it has to be a square, uh, uh, like a cube uh, shape. So you can call this topic, I don't remember the name now, but you call the topic with a new shape, you provide it as a vector of point, and then it automatically changes the, the shape. So the path planner will take now the new shape. Mm -hmm. And you can do it vice versa. When you release the card, you can change again into the round. So with the round, it can move on more situation, right? Yeah, and also you can use it um Maybe you don't change your shape, but you more more security. Oh, For yes. example, you have a very big object, and then it has more inertia. The robot, so you might want a bigger footprint, so that uh, maybe the error in movement is bigger. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. More questions. One final one. Yeah. Um, let's choose one. Yes. For example. Okay, Lucas Mendera. He says. Once the environment map is made, how often it is updated? I understand that the local planner detects uh, obstacles on the fly, and but how often is the map updated for a robot working in a real world? I think in this, for what I did here, the the map isn't updated. Like the there are sort of two maps. One is the map that the global planner uses, and then. But the local planner definitely updates. Okay. Okay. So I think that that's the last question. So let's thank again our speaker. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Bye. bye bye. Now remember that uh, you have to rate the speaker. So it's going to appear now on your screen a rating rating square, so you can rate the speaker for the final decision that we'll say today at the end of the conference, who is the best speaker of the conference. And then after you have voted, you can switch to the docs tab and then open the project for the next speaker. Okay, um, we are going to do uh, uh, the break now. Yes. The coffee break. Yeah. So let's have a 20 minute break now to have a coffee and observe the nice deep sea here. Yes. And next speaker session will start right after this coffee break of around 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go out in the habitable area here in the deep sea, um, we have very limited stock of uh, uh, dive suits, suits, dive suits. Yeah. So it's first uh, arrived, first served. Um, but there's a very good view of the sharks and the whales. So mm -hmm. I really recommend you. That, but for the people like us that we love coffee, maybe we have to go to Starbucks. Yeah, Starbucks coffee. Yes, <laughs> let's go there to Starbucks. Our Starbucks coffee is sure. on the floor number 23 on the platform. 
number 23, and we can go there, have some coffee, some lunch. If you want to join us, you are welcome. Um, a small thing before we go to the coffee break, our sponsors, Eprosima has gives, uh, given us a small poll of only five questions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's super fast. Uh, we will post it in the chat right now, and we will be very grateful that you fill it up. Uh, that way, Aproxima knows um, what you like, what you don't like, and what they can work on in next steps. Yes, let me post it here. I'm posting this. It's a very simple poll, fi five questions, and then it's going to, uh, to let them know what do you think about uh, fast DBS and so on. Mm -hmm. So there it goes. That is the link. Okay. So, coffee break? Yes, coffee break. Start.
Welcome back. So, please, uh, the first thing that you need to do before starting with anything else is to remember to open the Rush Jet for the next uh, speaker. Okay, so everything will be ready when the speaker starts speaking. And that's the first thing. And yeah. in our control center, they are telling me that there are some interesting tweets and images that the, the viewers, the attendants have sent of their setups and so on. So let's have a look at what we have. Uh huh. Whoa. Very nice. Yes. Very nice. Double screen. That's a very good idea. Maybe triple with the iPad. Ah, maybe triple with the iPad. Yeah. Uh huh. Very good. Fantastic for. From Maladi Naga Sub Subhash. So yes. thanks, thanks a lot for the tweet. Very good. Fantastic. What and else? The next one. Wow, this one's a gamer. Yes. With the drone there. It looks like, uh, yes, yeah, like a gamer. So two keyboards. Well, the yeah, laptop. It has my, my same mouse. The same mouse. <laughs> also the pad for the mouse. Uh, it's my Mayank Joneja. So thanks a lot for the tweet. Thank Fantastic you. setup. And then uh, from Brett Aldrich. Brett, looks, Brett, you look like an, a hacker <laughs> in there. So many. Yeah. In the Matrix or yes. in Cyberpunk. Awesome. Wow. Very cool light amb ambient. Fantastic. That's a triple, no, four screens. I don't know how many screens there are. <laughs> like a hacker. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. What else? And then Juan Sebastián Barret with uh, three screens also. iPad, taking some notes maybe, and yes. uh, a great PC there, laptop, and the screen. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, I think that the double screen system is winning, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. It's very convenient. It's very convenient. Do we have any other more? No, Not so no. far. Okay. Okay. okay, so remember, post in the hashtag. And we'll show them uh, after the coffee breaks and so on. So, and we'll choose four at the end that we will win a t-shirt like this one. Yeah. Great.